shows. Two, two options. You gave me the option between Area 51, which is what we're doing today, and parallel or multiverse universes. So, I really actually liked both of those ideas. But, Area 51, I don't know, has a little more spectacle to it. So, let's see what we can find out about it. Now, at first, I actually thought... search that I didn't know that much about Area 51, and I don't particularly know much specifically about that, but I do, I did realize that um, I've watched, really through Joe Rogan, having on Graham Hancock, and um, all sorts of other uh, fringe academics and reporters. Randall Carlson, Robert Bouval, John Anthony West. Um, I don't know if he's he's talked to uh, David Wilcock. This gentleman right here. With the uh, fabulously timeless... But you can't judge a book by its cover. And he's actually, you know, that was actually kind of rude of me to judge him like that. Um, he just owns that haircut so well. I wish I had the courage to do that. He, I, I listened to this guy have a conversation with, oh wait, it was, it was here. with Graham Hancock um, about, well, it's funny, it's the meeting of the cocks, I guess, about, well, the origin of humanity, secret origin, and there's a whole, uh, there's a whole rabbit, I'm gonna really try hard to stay on track, um, I'm just trying to give you a context for, for, uh, my understanding of this. So, uh, Graham Hancock is a journalist and author, and he writes anything about things, fiction and, uh, how, how do you, you know, the threshold of nonfiction, he tries to accumulate facts in some of his books and um, extrapolate from them and uh, posit, you know, potential origins of humanity and more mystical elements of history, such as the, maybe the potential, the possibility of a, an advanced civilization that was on Earth 15, maybe even 30,000 years ago. So I think that's very, very, very interesting to me, especially when they have some evidence, such as uh, Gobekli Tepe. And you know what? Beckley Tepe. Um, look up some images for you guys. Which is 
one of the few sites to actually be verified by credible academic geologists and archaeologists to have been 10,000 years old. So 10,000 years ago in Turkey, which uh, is not, of course, is modern day Troy. It's not probably only a couple hundred miles away from where we think Troy was 9,000 years after this, mind you. So it's definitely no, no wonder that perhaps the Trojan Wall claimed to be built as we're learning in, uh, in our expedition through the Odyssey, you know, the adventures of Odysseus, uh, that Poseidon himself built the Wall of Troy, which you can't imagine a people would come to believe if they, A, had no real written history, and B, had um, no scientific perspective of the world, and the world was more a blend of metaphors and religious imagery and um, a living a living world, really, that, that uh, was very much infused with spirituality, so it wouldn't be a stretch for them. Um, I really want to sound like Chicho right now. Chicho is awesome. And he just makes me feel like him, like he saying, right, right. It wouldn't be a stretch, right, to uh, to assume that these people during a thousand or fifteen hundred BC looked back at eight thousand years, and of course, knowing Gobekli Tepe had all this acres and acres and acres of these huge monoliths. It wouldn't be a stretch to think that perhaps in their view humans were less likely than gods to have actually created these monuments and therefore their own walls. And like many cities, maybe Troy was built and raised, pillaged, plundered. connected with the imagery of the phoenix. So, Area 51, which I might not call this episode Area 51, because so far, 10 minutes have gone by, even though I haven't talked about it. I just want to say that I think there's a blurry line between where fringe, um, the word keeps escaping me, I want to say sup- supposition, uh, speculation, there we go, right, speculation, right, and rigorous adherence to not speculating in just the facts on what we know, and, um, I think science has its merit that it's very valuable to not overextend our certainty of knowledge. And there's so many realms, so many ways I can take this, but I think the spec, the great speculators who actually are as rigorous as one can be when speculating about such grandiose things as aliens and deep, deep history. I think they're immensely valuable because they lead to more artistic, more religious, more spiritual, more philosophical, at a more more articulated level, um, understanding of history and the world as we discover it. So I think it's always good to take into account and not be too certain that one area, one area of, uh, of uh, exploration is sufficient to explain.
explain the whole world. So, um, I just want to credit science and religion and rigorous, uh, you know, archaeology and fact checking and logic, so logic and mathematics with, um, narratives and the human experience. And I don't think, oh, I should be doing these, shouldn't I? I just don't think that one or the other has the, the final word yet. Well, that was a doozy of an intro. Maybe sure I thought this would be a 30 minute episode. Um, so, in the middle of the barren Nevada desert, there is a dusty, unmarked road that leads to the front gate of Area 51. It's protected by little more than a chain link fence and a boom gate and intimidating trespass signs. One would think that America's much mythicized top secret military base would be under closer guard. But make no mistake, they are watching. Beyond the gate, cameras see every angle. On the distant hilltop, there is a white pickup truck with a tinted windshield on everything
the forbidden aspect. Forbidden aspect of Area 51 is what makes people want to know what's there, says aerospace historian and author Peter Merlin, who's been researching Area 51 for Sure, there's a there's still a lot going on there. Okay, so so I want to do flush out as much as I can in this one episode. The both sides of a very practical um, very scientific. Tom DeLong, 
claiming very matter-of-factly that aliens are here and they've actually um, in some way or some form or another given certain people and it would happen like that but nonetheless it's hard to believe certain upper echelon people in the government specific um, very very uh, very special access to their technology to uh, bend space you know just very 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 advanced technology um, so yeah we have guys like David Wilcock um, who actually it's funny enough oddly enough although from an outsider like me Tom DeLong and David Wilcock are very much in the same boat and they should be friends but they actually um, I guess Tom DeLong is so famous and so popular that uh, David Wilcock hasn't had the uh, invitation to speak with him about this which David Wilcock has been studying this for years and like decades and so it's uh, a little uh, I think a little bit of resentment and jealousy that Tom DeLong comes in and steals his spotlight as far as the uh, alien investigation goes. But yeah, so we had Tom DeLong from Blink-182 in the last year saying that aliens are here. Um, number one, Area 51. Out of the ten evidence is evidences that prove Area 51 aliens are real. Number one is that it's situated in the middle of the deserts of Nevada and people from nearby towns have reported sightings of strange lights as per eyewitnesses the lights do not look like they're let me zoom in a little bit they do not look like they're coming from fighter jets or other So well done 
that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. You simply So I think that um, the aliens, at least pictures of them, could definitely be manufactured. Um, granted, I'm sure the technology is much, much better nowadays. Look. Yeah, look at this. So that's her in the fat suit, and it's just... But, you know, I'm keeping an open mind because the Drake equation is pretty, pretty convincing to me that we have so many, we just have billions and billions of stars in our galaxy alone, just our galaxy, and there's, they think, trillions of galaxies, you know, um, we'd be pretty darn special we truly were the only the only uh, sentient beings out there so I just think a lot of this is hope, hopeful, you know and I also think that it distracts from making putting forth genuine effort to make the world that we do know exists and the people we do know are real and suffering really suffering, um, and assuaging their suffering, you know, so I'd like to uh, focus on what we do know before we start speculating about conspiracies, but nonetheless, I do think it's fun. So, the corpse of the alien is believed, is believed to have been collected from the crash site. Or the crash remains in Roswell. Um, of the Roswell incident, were being secretly transported to Area 51 as the government wanted to study the technology that was used to make the aircraft. So, Number five, which is more, more convincing. Testimonies of ex-employees. Here we go, an ex-aerospace engineer, Boyd Bushman. So he's an engineer. He's not, um, that tells you that he's at least scientifically minded and is professionally trained to analyze a situation in terms of physics, mathematics, mechanics. Um, but that doesn't mean his desire to jump to the conclusion that we are among aliens. It's a powerful desire. I think Carl Sagan wanted it too, but his famous dictum was, extraordinary um, uh, claims require extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. So, this is a picture, an ex 
Tech's aerospace engineer Boyd Bushman, who was deployed at Area 51 for a long period, has shared photos of a humanoid creature, um, creatures that do not belong from this soil. In a statement, Bushman also confirmed that the staffs of Area 51 are a mixed bag of earthlings and extraterrestrial beings. Wow. Wow. Um, Ex-physicist Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar, who was working... I think this guy is very particularly famous. Very famous. Who, who was working at Area 51. He had been deployed at the project of reverse engineering the alien aircrafts. Honestly, a, uh, an alien interstellar, or at least, yeah, interstellar spaceship, it does make sense that to deflect the maximum amount of debris to be most aerodynamic and particle dynamic, I guess, space dynamic, um, you would want the edge to be as small as possible, the leading edge, and then taper up from there so that the particles that can slice through a field of particles. Um, let's back out a little bit. So number seven, there are rare footage, no, there are video footages that show an ex-engineer working um, from Area 51 claiming that there were four live aliens used to be stationed at Area 51 and worked alongside humans in the flying tasks of strange looking aircrafts of futuristic designs. The engineer had worked there from 66 to 79, 1979. Okay, so. So in July 2014, a tourist named Sandra reported the sighting of a real UFO over Area 51. She had filmed the UFO's flight while she was traveling through the desert and was uh, recording the area in her movie camera from the bus window. She spotted something fly real fast before she could even react. Then the object was gone.
reviewing the film she had taped, she could realize that what she seemed, what it seemed, to be a flying bird was an alien UFO in reality. In reality. Um, there are many conspiracy theories regarding the kind of work that is carried out. directly related to get into the history of it. It's directly related to the development of the U-2 reconnaissance aircraft. After World War II, the Soviet Union lowered the Iron Curtain around themselves and the rest of the Eastern Bloc, creating a near-intelligence blackout to the rest of the world.
the Soviets backed North Korea's invasion of South Korea in June 1950, it became increasingly clear that the Kremlin would aggressively expand its influence. America worried about the USSR's technology, technology intentions, and ability to launch a surprise attack. Only a decade removed from the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So, anybody old enough, um, I mean, let's see, I start remembering things from when I was about. Understanding more wide, not political, but more national and global events that happened. So, anybody maybe born or an intelligent kid born before that, um, later than that, but maybe 90, 93, 1993, definitely remembers some shape some form of 9-11 and I like to put it in perspective I like to put it in perspective of uh, you know 10 years 1945 and 1955 or 1940 and 1950 it's the same as 2001 to 2011 so just um it's interesting to reference modern events and have a connection between those two times. So in the early 50s, the U.S. Navy and Air Force sent low-flying aircraft on reconnaissance missions over the USSR, but they were at constant risk of being shot. In November 1954, President Eisenhower approved the secret development of a high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft called the U-2 program. And one of the first orders of business was to track down a remote covert location and training for training and testing. So they found it in the southern Nevada desert near a salt flat known as Groom Lake which had once been a uh, World War II aerial gunnery range for the Army Air Corps Air Corps pilots known by its map designation as Area 51 this middle of nowhere site became a top sightings, unidentified flying objects. If you read the details of a 1992 CIA report that was declassified with redactions in 1998 and then released nearly in full in 2013, it's easy to see why. Many of these sightings were observed by commercial airline pilots who had never seen an aircraft fly at such high altitudes. 
Whereas today's airliners can soar as high as 45,000 feet, which is uh, 9 miles, I think. Almost 9 miles. Or in, in the mid 1950s, airlines flew only at about 10 to 20,000 feet. No military aircraft. feet would have been crazy. So, naturally, it says, Air Force officials knew the majority of these sightings were U-2 tests. halted in the late 50s and were replaced by more recent, more technologically advanced military aircrafts. Of course, over the years, the A-12 and numerous stealth aircrafts like the Bird of Prey, the F-117A, and the Tacit Blue have all been developed and tested. More declassified documents reveal Area 51's role in the project in the Project Hab Donut, a 1970s attempt to study covertly obtained Soviet MiGs. Wow. And someone's uh someone's quoted as saying. So our resident aeros aerospace historian Peter Merlin says they flew, they flew them over Area 51 and pitted our own fighters against them to develop tactics the, the, against the MiGs. And they learned that you can't outturn it, but you can outrun it, and it's still going on today. So instead of MiG 17s and 21s. There's MiG-29s and SU-27s. The fights are ongoing. In September 2017, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel was killed under mysterious circumstances when his plane crashed in Nevada and the Pentagon would not immediately ID the aircraft. It seems he was most likely flying a foreign jet. Chat, but 
just going to say experimental plane testing. And look at that, it's 41% only think it's not aliens. Um, still a roughly even ratio though, 60-40. So in 1989, the year I was born, alien conspiracies gained ground when Bob Lazar claimed in an interview on Las Vegas local news that he'd seen aliens and it helped to reverse engineer alien spacecraft while working at the base. Many have disregarded this as fiction. as uh, some are even mad because they worked on these things and they built these amazing planes. This is actually Earth technology and you got folk claiming, folks out here claiming it's extraterrestrial when it's really good old American know-how. That's, that's quite the quote. That's the one I was going to read. So and here's a uh, a good so we have the aircraft here aircraft the aircraft base sorry I was busy unplugging my keyboard so I can type on it um, yeah we can see you know runway base facilities. Not really sure what this is. But mountains run off from the rains. I was working at the Yuma Proving Grounds last definitely pretty secretive out there. So today, it's very much in use. According to Google Earth, new construction and expansions are continually happening. Our most early mornings, on the most early mornings, on, on most early mornings, Eagle has visitors can spot strange lights in the sky moving up and down. No, it's not a UFO. It's actually the semi-secret contract commute commuter airline. Contract commuter airline using the call sign Janet that transports workers from Las Vegas's McCarran Airport to the base. As for what's happening these days, most in America's most secretive military base. Few know for sure. Merlin has some educated guests, including improved stealth technology, advanced weapons, electronic warfare systems, and in particular,
But yeah, Merlin. Merlin hits it on the head any time at the most basic level, psychologically. Any time you have something secret or forbidden, it's human nature. You want to find out what it is. And what a better way to end this episode with that little quote. I like that. I would like that, wouldn't I? So, well guys, I, uh, I was going to read some of the Wikipedia article, but that article was pretty sufficient, and I have to, I have to get going to my new job, top secret, I can't be late, they shut down the, they locked down the facility at a certain time, and um, I must go, I must depart. respect.